This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining us for this uh, special end of the year episode. As you guys know, what I tend to do at the end of the year is I invite special guests on to talk about a case that uh, we feel maybe has been covered a lot, but maybe we might try to cover it a little bit differently. And this month, what we're doing is we're taking three pretty well-known cases and kind of breaking them down a little bit to go beyond what is common knowledge about these cases that people feel like they know them or they know what happened or certain opinions that have been out in the media or out um, even in true crime for a while. Looking at those and seeing like, what do we know to be true? What is myth? And just breaking down those cases. So this time, and I never really thought I would cover this case, the OJ Simpson murder trial for the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. I really didn't think I would cover it because it's such a big case and it's been done so much, but we're going to take kind of a little portion of it, at least, and try to drill down a little bit. And to help me with this, this is my most requested guest always, is my sister Yolanda. Hey, Yolanda. Hello. Hello. (laughs) So we're back. It's been, gosh, a while since we recorded together. The first one we did was a Scott Peterson case, if you guys remember that. Uh, we got a lot, we got a lot of comments. and the ranch dressing and the ranch dressing yeah so we really like to cover these cases that we feel like um, there's a lot of information and maybe we can just kind of pull some things out of it that maybe she's been thinking about the case or I've been thinking about the case and so we decided to do that with this one we're not going to go into it comprehensively it's basically going to be like an outline and then we're going to pull out certain aspects of the case. I guess the first thing I was going to ask Yolanda is um, it was such a huge case. It was such a huge trial. It went on went on for like over a year. And of course, here in California, it was a huge thing. But I think it was pretty much worldwide. Of course, it had celebrity aspect to it with O.J. Simpson, lots and lots of media coverage. How closely did you follow the case when it was happening? <laughs> well, um, so the whole white bronco infamous white bronco happened on my birthday and i don't know if you remember but you were with me yep and we were in it was uh your daughter's what seventh grade graduation i believe it was eighth grade graduation seventh yeah something like that like that and we had gone for my birthday and for her graduation out to eat and we were at a restaurant and the bar had all of the televisions up and there was like this white Bronco, you know, on every single one of them and everybody's in the bar and they're all talking about it. And we're like, what the heck's going on? And they were like, OJ Simpson, you know, he's in a white Bronco slow chase. And we're like, what? <laughs> so yeah, that was very memorable. <laughs> yeah, it was. That was kind of the thing. I think the news about the murders had been out. And of course it was like, what happened? But when the Bronco chase, the so-called Bronco chase happened, that's when I think it went kind of worldwide where everybody's watching this. You're right. I remember being, oh, yeah. at, I remember being in the restaurant and we were all sitting at a table. I actually had gone to the restroom and as I was walking through the bar, I saw everybody was looking up at the television screens and people were standing in the bar, not just, you know, people that were sitting in the bar, people that, yeah. you know, went into the bar and were looking up at the television screens and I'm seeing this white you know, car down the freeway. And I'm like, what the heck's going on? I first, I didn't pay attention to it, went to the restroom, came out. And then I finally was really careful. I'm like, what is happening? And they're like, it's OJ Simpson. He's a fugitive or something. And I'm like, what? <laughs> that yeah. was just surreal. At that point, I was like, wow, someone's guilty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was the first thing that went through my head. I'm like, well, I guess we know who did it. <laughs> yeah, it was super crazy. By that time, it just became like this phenomenon, right? So I'm going to do a really quick summary for anybody who maybe just arrived on this planet and has absolutely no idea about what happened on June 12, 1994, because everybody has heard. I mean, I don't care if you weren't born then. You have probably heard 
some of the details of this case. And also because we know that because true crime has become such a big thing that there's been so many other things that have come out even just recently about this case. And some of it's been really good. And some of it has been like, what? Where did you get that information? So I think sometimes because everybody's trying to cover this and get an audience to watch, they try to make it like blow it up bigger or make it like, well, wait a minute, do we really know what happened? You know, that kind of thing. And it's like, uh, yeah, if we live there, we watched it for a year. <laughs> we know what happened. But at least we exactly. know what we, we think we know what happened. And the other thing, too, is I, w- I just wanted to say really quickly is that beyond watching the news coverage, I watched the trial every single day. Like when I wasn't watching it, when I was at work, I was listening to it. The entire trial was played over the radio, on TV, all day long, all day. Mm-hmm. I mean, but not even just summaries. They had cameras and microphones, everything in the courtroom. So you were watching it live. And when I couldn't watch it because I was at work at my desk, I would have my earbuds in listening to it on the radio. So I listened to pretty much every detail. And a lot of them were really boring <laughs> because there could be a lot of things about you know, DNA. And we're going to go into that a little bit. But I watched it. And then afterwards read a lot of stuff that came out, watched interviews. I mean, it was just kind of the thing. And and I really learned a lot at that time about our justice system, and, and especially in California, and how it worked and how it didn't work and what was involved. So it was very interesting. It was a very educational experience to even just follow this case. And I think a lot of the American public and even the public around the world in general learned how, you know, court worked in the United States, how the justice system kind of was run. So anyway, all that to say, there's a lot of details in this and we're going to pull out some of the ones that we thought were more interesting, but I'm just going to do a quick summary of what happened. On the night of June 12, 1994, Nicole Brown Simpson, 35, and Ronald Goldman, 25, were found stabbed to death in front of Nicole's condo in Los Angeles, California. She had been stabbed seven times in the neck and head and her throat had been slit from ear to ear. She also had defensive wounds on her hands. Ron Goldman, an acquaintance of Nicole's who'd stopped by her home that evening to return a pair of sunglasses belonging to Nicole's mother, was found dead slumped near the small courtyard's fence with a cut to his throat, two stab wounds to the chest, and several other serious knife injuries. I have read anything from 25 to 30 stab wounds on Ron Goldman. He also had defensive wounds on his hands and arms. Nicole was the ex-wife of former pro football player turned actor O.J. Simpson. She had met Simpson in 1977 when she was an 18-year-old waitress and he was a 29 or 30-year-old married father of three. They began dating and Simpson divorced his wife in 1979. However, he and Nicole didn't marry until 1985. That year, their first child, a daughter they named Sydney, was born. A son, Justin, was born three years later. By this time, O.J. was retired from football and had become a popular television personality, doing a series of commercials as a spokesperson for Hertz Rental Cars and other major corporations. He began acting in television shows and movies around 1976. He even had a small part, I didn't remember this, he had a small part in the 1977 blockbuster television miniseries, Roots. The role he is probably most often associated with is as a detective in the comedy movie franchise, Naked Gun, starring Leslie Nielsen. O.J. Simpson was featured in all three Naked Gun films. Nicole and O.J.'s marriage was called a, quote, textbook case of domestic violence by an expert in the field. It was reported that the much older and wealthy celebrity controlled his wife with threats, intimidation, violence, and withholding finances. And there was documented evidence of this, not only by um, the LAPD, but also by Nicole herself that would come to light later on. So what we're going to do is first get to how did this come to be? How did this happen? And like I said, the uh, textbook case of domestic violence was something that was continuing throughout their marriage, uh, the relationship, actually. She does tell one story about the night she met O.J. Simpson. Do you you remember that, Yolanda, uh, when she told a friend Mm -mm. about this? She came home and like the seams on the side of her jeans were ripped open. They were like, okay, what happened? And she said, oh, he basically ripped her clothes off of her. That's your first date with this guy. You know, and that to me is very odd that that would be okay with her. But you have to remember the age difference and who he was and who she was. So we're going to talk a little about about how influential he was 
not only in her life and how much control and power he had over her, but even her entire family was really indebted to him in, in several ways when it, it came to financially and career and jobs and stuff. So, so we're going to talk a little bit about other relationship and I got a pretty good outline. It's pretty long. So I'm just going to go over like some highlights. It was really important for people to know the history of their relationship in order to get what was going on in this marriage and how it came to be that he became a suspect in his wife's, I mean, brutal, brutal murder, right? Nicole Brown Simpson, she graduated from high school and like within a few weeks, she met OJ Simpson. He was 29. He was getting ready to retire from pro football, but he had a lot of other businesses and things going on. So he was doing very well. It wasn't just like, oh, he's just some washed up football player. He was an entrepreneur. He had several projects going. He had already starred in a couple of movies, like side kind of bit parts or whatever. He was in The Towering Inferno, which was a huge movie in the 70s, like the mid or late yeah. 70s. So he was moving out of being a athlete into a celebrity, basically. He became a celebrity. Like I said, when he met Nicole, he was already married. He was married to his first wife, Marguerite, for 10 years. They had three three kids. As a matter of fact, I think, if I'm not mistaken, Marguerite was pregnant with their third child when OJ started seeing Nicole. If, I believe that's what I read. Right away, everybody said, you know, she became like, how would you, how would you put it? She was basically on OJ's arm. His arm candy? Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. That was her role. I mean, she was, she's a beautiful girl. You know, she was very young, blonde, just gorgeous. As a matter of fact, later on, she would do a little bit of modeling, but OJ wouldn't really go for that very much. He kind of, it's weird. And this is, again, the classic abusive spouse. He liked people looking at his wife because that's my wife. And he would even call her his property. But he didn't like it because he would get jealous. And then he yeah. would blame her and he would take it out on her. You know, she was between a rock and a hard place all the time with that kind of attitude of his. This is from an e online article from... June 12, 2019, written by Natalie Finn. It's like I said, it's pretty comprehensive, but her father was uh, American. He was serving in the Air Force. He met his wife, Juditha, when he was stationed in Germany, married her, and came back to the States. They moved to the, the Southern California area. There would be four daughters in the Brown family. Uh, Nicole's older sister was Denise. It's funny, Denise looks just like Nicole, but she's brunette. Yeah. They have like the exact same face. And then later on, they had two other daughters, Dominique and Tanya, who were younger than Nicole. She had just graduated from high school. She started taking classes at a, a Southern California college. Within a month of meeting OJ, it says she moved in with him, but he was still married. What I kind of gathered, and I, I don't know if I'm exactly correct about this, but that he rented an apartment in Beverly Hills and that's where she moved into. And she would say this later on because he wanted her available to him whenever he wanted her yeah. available to him. Well, wasn't his family up north? Yeah, they were in the San Francisco area. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. For a little bit. Yeah. Actually, what I read later on. So, okay, this is what's confusing because he's from San, he was from San Francisco. His mother lived in San Francisco. I believe that him and Marguerite lived there too for a while, but, and this is a thing that I didn't know until I was just doing the research or maybe I forgot. Oh yeah. They, she lived at Rockingham. She lived at Rockingham. Exactly. He basically set Nicole up in an apartment around the corner because Beverly Hills is, you know, right there. Mm -hmm. Um, and he would kind of bounce between places and that's where Nicole would be. So at that point she dropped out of college Kathy Lee Crosby says it was a very passionate, a very volatile, a very obsessive relationship on both sides, she said. She had known OJ for 15 years and had spent time with a couple, um, she once told the LA Times. But there's lots of incidents of people saying, seeing OJ yelling at Nicole, belittling her, putting her down, treating her like property. Her sister Denise actually testified to this in the trial said when Denise first met him on a trip to Buffalo to watch him play for the Buffalo Bills, that's the football team he played with, and this was like in the late 1970s, Denise said Nicole had greeted a friend of OJ's with a kiss on each cheek, and he, quote, got real upset and started screaming at Nicole. Simpson and his wife divorced in 1979, 
I found this also strange too, because he was already basically living with Nicole, but they didn't get married for another six or seven years. I think it was. Mm -hmm. I was surprised about that. Pretty much the same month or that same time frame when him and his wife divorced, their youngest daughter, who was just under two years old, drowned in the swimming pool at Rockingham. Another reason, like, wow, they still stayed at Rockingham. You know, that was odd. Yeah. Because that's, I mean, that's pretty tragic. So now, yeah, he has two kids, two surviving children from Marguerite, and then he would have two children with Nicole later on. There's a lot of quotes from Chris Jenner, who was a, a good friend of Nicole and OJ's because she was married to Robert Kardashian, who, of course, plays a big part in this whole case later on. But yeah, they were good friends. So she was a witness to a lot of things as well. But she said in her experience, Nicole hid a lot from most people about what was going on in the marriage. If you think about it, though, so Chris was married to Robert Kardashian, Mm -hmm. right? Right. And he was friends with OJ. So do you tell your girlfriend who's married to your husband's best friend, everything that's going on, because what are they going to do? He's going to turn around and tell OJ everything that she's been saying because his wife's going to tell him. So of course she's going to hide, you know, she's going to hide that. I thought about that when I read that part. I was like, well, of course she's not going to say anything. Yeah. And and I did also read where it said that pretty much almost their entire relationship, except for her family, all of her friends were OJ's friends, which again, is a classic controlling behavior of one partner to another Yeah, where, you know, you don't have any outside friends from, from mine because I don't know those people or what you're doing. And you're right. They would be more loyal to OJ and they were, you know, for the most part they yeah. were. So Nicole and OJ married on February 2nd, 1985 in the backyard of the Rockingham estate. Okay. So he's, he's married. He raises his kids with his first wife cheating on Nicole and, you know, they're, they're living at Rockingham and then they get divorced. She moves somewhere else. I'm sure he, she had another property somewhere that he purchased or whatever. And then moves his mistress in to the same house. And the thing that I got with that was that that was OJ's house. Like it wasn't Marguerite's house or Nicole's house no. or the family no. home. It was OJ's house. You know, that, that's what I got from that. So they married on February 2nd. Their daughter, Sydney, was born that October, so she was probably pregnant or just barely pregnant when they got married, and their son, like I said, wasn't born till, for another three years. Basically, everywhere OJ was, Nicole was, you know, they had parties together, they had people over, it was, again, mostly OJ's friends, people in the media, people, you know, like other actors, football players, celebrities, you know, it was that whole lifestyle, I think. This is the thing that was interesting to me. She was very close to her family, her mother, father, and her sisters. But he also found a way to get everybody kind of beholden to him in some ways, right? And on the outside, you can look and say, oh, this is a very nice thing for him to do because, you know, he has money and he has connections and whatever. But later on, when you see, not even later on, but pretty much pretty quickly, when you see what the relationship is between Nicole and OJ, it seems a little bit more manipulated or even ominous in some ways. So Nicole's father, Lou Brown, ran the Hertz rental car outpost that Simpson owned at the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Laguna Niguel, which is in um, Southern California. Very nice hotel. You know that Hertz rental car place was making some bucks, right? Yeah. And OJ even paid for uh, one of Nicole's sisters, Dominique's, USC tuition. So University of Southern California, which is a very pricey college. It's a private college. Yeah. He had also hired a first cousin of Nicole's named Rolf Bauer as the gardener of his estate and then appointed him manager of two pioneer chicken locations that he owned. So he owned this franchise of these chicken fast food restaurants. And this guy who was first he hired as a gardener, then he made him the manager of these two things. Uh, Rolf's wife, Maria, worked as OJ's housekeeper at Rockingham. So the whole family is like on the payroll here, right? Or is getting to be on the payroll here. From this article, it just says, but at the same time, all of her friends were his friends. That's the, what I saw earlier. And he kept yeah. everyone close, ensuring that Nicole hardly opened up to anyone about what was really going on behind closed doors. 
friends of hers say that no one really knew her during their marriage. Sometimes she was supposed to be somewhere and all of a sudden it would be canceled or she'd call and say she couldn't come and OJ would call with an excuse. And now looking at some of the documentation that Nicole had created and kept in a safety deposit box would have been times that he basically had abused her and she couldn't show up with a bruised face or bruises on her body or whatever. People that were in the home said they would hear, you know, yelling and screaming and just all of these kind of things. Yeah. One of the people that was the maid Mm -hmm. who was actually kind of related to Nicole because she was married to his cousin. Right. Right. To her cousin. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, but she was being paid by OJ, you know, and I'm sure he paid pretty well. So what do you do? So anyway, very volatile relationship. He was extremely jealous, very jealous. And I know there's a lot of people that would be like, you know, well, why didn't she leave? If, if, why did she let this go on so long? And that's typical. You know, people always say that. But in her case, she knew him since she was 18. Right. She'd never really held a job. She had didn't have a college degree because she had to quit because he wanted her with him. Mm-hmm. And she had nothing of her own. Absolutely nothing. In fact, if you think about it, they weren't even married for the first, what did you say, six, seven years? Yeah. So she had no recourse at all at that point. No. If she left him, she left with nothing. Mm -hmm. She was still in her 20s. I mean, she was, you know, I think about my daughter who's about that age now, and it's like, yeah, they make really stupid decisions at that point. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you're right. She was she was very young. She was a teenager when she met him. I also think that like you said, she didn't have anything going on except for OJ at that time and he kept it that way for a long time. He didn't marry her for a long time. And then by that time, that was all she knew was being with OJ. She didn't have any power in the relationship at all. She was just very um, dependent on him at that point. So there's going to be several incidents of domestic violence that are called into the LAPD. And during their marriage, even though he was so jealous uh, of her and she couldn't see anybody or talk to anybody or any of that, he repeatedly cheated on her. I mean, over and over. As a matter of fact, one of of the things I just read, and I didn't know this, is that he had a, like a two-year affair, I think, with Tawny Katane while he was married to Nicole. Sounds about right. Okay, so in 1985, there was a domestic violence call to their house. That's the one where Detective Mark Furman actually came to the house on that call. And he's going to be one of the first detectives on the scene uh, at the murders. But he responded to the domestic violence call That's the one where Nicole, I believe, was outside in like sweatpants and just her bra and was cowering behind the car. It was a Mercedes parked outside and the the car windshield had been smashed in by a bat by OJ. Yeah, fall winter of 1985. And she told him that her husband OJ Simpson had smashed the windshield with the bat. There was another one uh, incident with the police in 1987. I don't know. Do you remember if he was arrested? On that one? I know the one on, um, that happened New Year's Day, I think it was. Oh, right. Um, and I think it, it might have been that one. That's the one where she actually had bruises and cuts on her face and, and the whole thing. Um, he took off. He took oh, off in his car, right. and I, apparently they didn't go after him. No, they didn't. You're right. And, no, but he, he eventually, I think he did go and turn himself in to the police station like mm-hmm. the next day. And, um, yeah, he got a, a slap on the hand for that whole situation. Right. Yeah. And later on when he was talking about it, he was like, well, yeah, it was just an argument. Nobody got hurt. He was, you know, in the media, he was even giving that, you know, as an explanation. You know, it's just people fight. We have our ups and downs. Like, it was no big deal. Yeah. And, you know, it seemed like as time went on, he was even more open with how he was abusing Nicole, at least around certain people, around, like, her family there was a story in the mid 1980s where that's where OJ threw Nicole and her sister Denise physically out of the house. This is what she says about that. She had made a comment to OJ that he was taking Nicole for granted and he flew into a rage after she said that to him. She says this then, quote, he ran upstairs, got clothes, started flying down the stairs and grabbed Nicole, told her to get out of his house, wanted us all out of his house, picked her up, threw her against a wall and then picked her up and threw her out of the house physically. She ended up falling. She ended up on her elbows and her butt. 
We were all sitting there screaming and crying, and he grabbed me and threw me out of the house. When these things would happen, she would either go to one of her sisters or her parents, but she would end up, you know, coming back. There was one time where she showed up in a Ferrari and said that was OJ's apology, giving her a Ferrari. So in 1988 is when she started confiding to Kris Jenner what was going on. She said, on a trip to New York, Nicole confided in her about various marital troubles that OJ was cheating on her and would get physically rough during fights. She said I, she wanted to leave him. She said, I don't know if I can stay. He's really hard to live with. She said, I want to leave him and I don't know how. And at this point, uh, Chris Jenner says that Nicole had really changed. She seemed more withdrawn. She just wasn't herself any, anymore. Like she used to be very bubbly and, and happy and friendly. And no matter what was going on, she was, you know, very active and she became really withdrawn seemed anxious, didn't talk to many people, and seemed to be edge on the t all the time. 1989 was that one you were t talking about, I think. It, this was a 4 a.m. She called 911. That's when she was outside in the bra. And she told the cops when they arrived, he's going to kill me. According to a police report from that morning, her left eye was black. She had a cut lip and a bruised forehead, and there was a handprint on her neck. And she told one of the officers, you guys never do anything. You never do anything. You come out. You've been here eight times and you never do anything to him. So another reason why it's like, you know, if I leave him and he comes after me, what's going to happen? Because they don't ever take him to jail. You know, nothing happens. So why would she feel safe calling the, the police officers, right? That's the one that you were talking about. That time they told OJ who denied hitting his wife saying he had just pushed her out of bed and that they had a drunken fight after a New Year's Eve party. He had to go with them to the police station. Instead, he drove off into the night in his Bentley. Nicole then went to the cops the next day, said she really didn't want to press charges, but since she had signed the police report, they were obligated to kick it up to the DA's office, which filed domestic violence charges against Simpson. He ended up pleading no contest to misdemeanor spousal battery. He was given 120 hours of community service, two years of probation, and twice a week counseling in order to pay $500 in restitution to a battered women's shelter. So two years of probation, but I think things happened in those two years and I don't think anything happened to him, you know? No. Yeah, that's that's mm -mm. that's what he, this is the, the quote that you were talking about. He, we had a fight, he told the television host about the incident. We were both guilty, he said. No one was hurt. It was no big deal and we got on with our lives. It wasn't that big of a deal. But a close-up photo of her bruised face was found after her death in a safety deposit box along with... Um, photos of her injuries from the New Year's Eve incident. She had somebody take pictures of her that time, which is pretty telling that she knew, you know, this is getting really bad and I need to document it. And that she and she put it in a safe deposit box of all places. Mm -hmm. I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Ana Luisa. I'm a huge fan of Ana Luisa jewelry for gift giving and for treating myself to beautiful, sustainable jewelry. Ana Luisa creates their pieces using the highest production standards while eliminating excessive waste, which is great for the planet. But for me, the best thing about Ana Luisa jewelry is how gorgeous each pendant, bracelet, ring, and set of earrings Ana Luisa makes. Your loved ones will be so thrilled and impressed when you present them with a gift from Ana Luisa. My favorite Ana Luisa item right now is a delicate gold pendant with a mother of pearl inlay. Even the delicate pieces feel substantial, and my pendant looks like it cost much more than I actually paid. Ana Luisa jewelry starts at just $39, but you'll swear it costs much more. And right now, if you use my link, shop.analuisa.com slash once, you can take advantage of sale prices up to 25% off. That's shop.analuisa.com slash once for up to 25% off Ana Luisa jewelry. It's their best sale of the year, so don't wait. Get your holiday gifts or treat yourself at shop.analuisa.com slash once. And thanks for supporting the show. So they end up separating finally. I think it was 1990 was the first time because she filed for divorce February 25th, 1990. So when she and uh, OJ separated, she moved into a rental house on Gretna Greenway in Brentwood. We hear a lot about that place during the trial because he was stalking her and neighbors would say they saw OJ standing outside. I believe she called the cops on him a couple of times for showing up at the house there. 
that's when Cato comes in, Cato Kalin. Her and her friend Faye Resnick, who also plays a part in this case a little bit, um, had met him. He was like a ski bum. <laughs> he was this young guy, like 21 or <laughs> 20 years old. Yeah, he was just one of these typical Southern California blonde surfer looking dude. He was a ski bum and he just was kind of a goofy guy. You know, he was just a friendly, goofy guy and the kids loved him. He was like a, like a big brother kind of energy towards them, I guess. And she ended up moving him into the guest house there at her new place and he would babysit the kids. At that time too is when she filed for divorce. She basically wrote in her a divorce filing that she had, you know, she had dropped out of college. She said, I only attended junior college for a very short time because Simpson wanted me to be available to travel with him whenever his career required him to go to a new location. She said, I have no other college education. I hold no degrees. I'm not currently employed and I spend my time caring for my two young children. So basically she didn't have any uh, resources beyond what OJ provided. So they settled the divorce in October, 1992. At that point, OJ agreed to pay Nicole a lump sum of $433,000 plus $10,000 a month in child support. She also retained the deed on a rental property in San Francisco that she would later sell, like right before her death, she would sell that. The $10,000 a month in child support, the rent on that Gretna Green house was $5,000. So she didn't have yeah. a lot of money. This is one of the things that I realized when I went to LA and I went to Bundy where, you know, where she was killed. And then I drove to Rockingham. First of all, the first thing that I noted so close. I did not realize how close those two, those two places were to each other. I drove back and forth at least twice to clock it. It was literally four minutes away. And, yeah. and you didn't have to get on any major roads to get between the two places. You could take back streets and it would be really easy to, to get between the two places without really encountering many stoplights. And the other thing I noted was Rocky, the Rockingham property. Now, by the time I went there, it had been sold. The original house had been demolished and another house had been built in its place. But what I also found out from research is that it was pretty much the same footprint of that house. It was about the same size house and where it was located and all that. They tend to do that because you have the, what do you call it? The um, foundation. The foundation, yeah. And the plumbing. Right, yeah. yeah. So, um, because even the, the guest house that was on the edge, like by the fence was still there. I don't know if, I think it was the same one because the way that it's described in the trial, and we'll talk about that, you know, in a minute, but, um, it seemed to be in the same location and I could see somebody coming over that fence, trying to go up that walkway along the side of that guest house. And it was narrow. You could see it from the fence. Um, so I think that was the same guest house maybe it was remodeled but I think it was in the same place um, I could be wrong but it sure did look like it was the same layout but anyway it's a mansion it's a mansion you know on this huge property the neighborhood I was surprised because the streets are very narrow and there's not really sidewalks the little kind of alleyway basically on the side of the house was where the Bronco was parked when the police came out to his house and in between like across the street it's just like a very narrow street but it's, you know, very nice area, big, huge lot, big, huge house. And then you drive to Nicole's and it's literally a condo that's connected to another condo and it's small yeah. and the neighborhood is not a, I mean, LA is expensive no matter where you go, but it's not a great, I would say it's a place like maybe teachers and cops might live. You know what I mean? It's not like a place yeah. where celebrities live and people with money and, you know, it, it's not at all. And it's just a regular neighborhood. What an ass. Because she, <laughs> she was living there with her two kids. He, the kids were not living at Rockingham. I mean, they would visit OJ now and, and then and, and go over, but they didn't live there in it for any intents and purposes. They lived full time with their mom in this tiny condo well, he lives in this big, gigantic mansion, and he gives her $10,000 in child support, which half of the money goes to her rent. Now, she got a lump sum. Yeah, so you better invest that wisely. She didn't have anything. She didn't have an education. She didn't have job experience. So, you know, she's going to have to figure out a way to make that work with two kids to raise on $5,000 a month from this guy that's getting royalties yeah. from, 
major motion pictures and all these businesses. So I guess the last thing that that said to me was that she just wanted the hell out of that marriage. You know, at some point, I don't care. Just give me enough to live on and I, I got to get the hell out of here. So that's what it appeared well, I, to me. Yeah. Well, and I think I read it in there that apparently the amount of money that she was given in their settlement and the amount of money she was getting for child support was, uh, or not the child support, but the, the settlement amount, she had signed a prenup. From what I remember from the past from reading about is that she basically had to badger him into marrying her. Mm-hmm. That was not something that he wanted to do. And it was probably a lot to do with the money because you said how long they were together before they ever got married. So I think that prenup was, you know, that was a major point of them getting, getting married. He also, she had to fight him on having kids. I remember that too. That was a huge hmm. like issue. Um, she wanted kids and he was, you know, basically not, he wasn't interested in it, but that's why that particular amount, she was able to get that. And she got the deed to a rental property in San Francisco. Those were the two things that she was able to get out mm-hmm. of the marriage. After all that time, yeah. and how much money did he make? Yeah. Yeah. No, you know? he, he really, yeah. One of the books that I read where he really fought everything as far as the money and didn't want to give her really anything. But here's the thing too, and this is something that, you know, people are definitely going to bring up. And again, we have to know the psychology of somebody who has been, you know, never had become her own person. She, she went from being a, a kid in high school to OJ's girlfriend and then OJ's wife and the mother of OJ's kids without having really any anything of her own. They got divorced, but she decided after it was like eight or nine months that she wanted him back. And then when she, you know, he was stalking her, all that was going on and then making it really hard for her to get the divorce. And then, you know, she's drifting because I guess doesn't know what to do without OJ and she wants him back and she tells her friends, I want my husband back. And he ghosts her. He like, won't take her calls, doesn't call her back, just ignores her. And again, another manipulation. He would say that he was fine without her. This went on for a little while. And then he said, yeah, I, you know, I want to get back together. And this was in, like I said, they got divorced in October 1992. A year later, on October 25th, 1993, Nicole is calling a 911 dispatcher again. That's the one that they play in the trial where she sounds very tired and weary and says, could you get someone over here now to 325 Gretna Green? He's back, please. And then asks what he looks like. She says, he's OJ Simpson. I think you know his record. Could you send somebody over here? He's fucking going nuts. And she starts kind of, her voice is breaking at that point. I remember that. And told to stay on the line. She repeats, I don't want to stay on the line. He's going to beat the shit out of me. And that was, it's a 13 minute, 911 call. It's it's heartbreaking to hear. I mean, she she just sounds so yeah. defeated. And the crazy thing is during that, Cato's there. Uh-huh. Cato's there. He's he's screaming and yelling and I don't know what he's saying to him or if he's saying anything. But he's doing that in front of someone else. Yeah. And this is when he came to the house in a rage about something that happened a year earlier when they were separated or, you know, divorced or almost divorced where she was dating somebody else and he was looking through her windows and Mm -hmm. saw her, you know, being intimate with this boyfriend of hers. And for some reason, a year later, this is now back in his brain and he's screaming at her, which is on the 911 call when she says, OJ, please, you know, the kids are sleeping. And he says, oh, you didn't give a shit when the kids, you know, when this, you were doing this guy in the living room, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, you didn't care about the kids. Then, and he's screaming. It's pretty obvious. If you follow the case, once all of this happens and they find Nicole and, and uh, Ron, they also find out that the kids are asleep in the house. Mm-hmm. And this just goes to show you that he never, ever cared in advance of that. Because people were like, there's no way he could have done it. His kids were in the house. He never would have let them find that. There's no way. Well, he never cared about what was going on with the kids. He didn't care if they heard. He didn't care if they saw. You know, I, I don't know if they ever did. She said that they slept like like the dead, like they did not wake up. They were rocks. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean that they weren't awake. Right. And, you know, just At not times. 
just not reacting. I mean, if this had been going on their whole lives, they probably learned how to shut down when that's going on around them, if they knew anything. Oh, yeah. You'd have to find a way to protect yourself or just your own psyche from hearing this screaming and, you know, seeing your mother or not even maybe seeing, but maybe hearing your mother being beaten or whatever's going on. It's something that can, you know, destroy somebody psychologically if they don't find, and kids find a way to basically just shut that out or do what they need to do to, you know, for their own survival, um, at least psychologically, even if they're not being hurt. Because by all accounts, he never did harm the children physically. That wasn't part of it. So they end up spending that Thanksgiving and Christmas together. This is 1993. But then it pretty much was over by the beginning of the next year. And um, she sold the San Francisco property and bought the condo at Bundy. She moved there in January of 1994. And this, of course, the murders happened in that summer in June. So it's only six months she's at Bundy. That spring, they're trying to do some things as uh, a family. Uh, Nicole and OJ and their kids went to Mexico for Easter with Chris and Bruce Jenner and their kids, Courtney, Kim, Chloe, and, and also their father, Rob Kardashian. Apparently, and this is all OJ's words mm-hmm. here, <laughs> is that during that time, when they got back together after they had gotten divorced, they had made an agreement that they were going to try it for a year. And it was like from Mother's Day to Mother's Day of one year to the next, Mm -hmm. that they were going to try and um, be a couple again. They were going to try different things. They were going to date and actually basically learn to fall in love again. And if, if after a year that didn't work out, then they both knew they were both going to be mature about it and, and then be done with this situation. That's according to what he had to say. I don't know what's true, but that's, right. so that's where they were in that time period. So it's funny that you say Mother's Day because that's, that would, that's in uh, May, right? So in May 1994, mm-hmm. she decided that she was done. So maybe it's, that's true. Maybe she was like, okay, we gave it that- a good shot. Yeah, according to him, it was all amicable, and they, you know, had this one last night together, and, you know, he left in the morning before the kids could see that he had spent the night, and, you know, that that's his whole take yeah. on it. Yeah, like, he's this very reasonable guy, but on her 35th birthday was on May 19th, and he gave her this very expensive bracelet, but a week later, she gave it back to him. Now, you know that's not going to sit well with him, because he used to always try to buy her affection back. She said she was done. Um, she wanted to live a happier, more peaceful life. And this time she said, you know, they said it looked like it was different. Like she really, she really meant it this time. Yeah. It's okay though. Cause he gave it to his girlfriend. So it was fine. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the thing that's so crazy is because yeah, he, he did. He actually mentions that in the police interview. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Real romantic, right. A real rom- romantic guy. Mm-hmm. Um, and the fact that, you know, he's saying, oh yeah, we gave it a shot. And meanwhile, he's still dating other people and he still have has another girlfriend and stuff so it's just yeah it's just so crazy after she gives this bracelet back this is when he starts threatening her about the irs stuff so around memorial day simpson told nicole that she had to stop using his address at rockingham and threatened to report her to the irs she had previously classified bundy as a rental property on her tax forms and was using the rockingham address as her permanent home of course this is when they were quasi back together i guess here's a diary entry dated june 3rd she had been writing uh, in a journal about some of the conversations that she had with them, some of the things that he would say to her, like on phone calls and stuff. So in one uh, June 3rd diary entry, she wrote, quoting OJ, you hung up on me last night. You're going to pay for this bitch. You're holding money from the IRS. You're going to go to jail, you effing C. You think you can do anything you want. You've got it coming. I've already talked to my lawyers about this bitch. They'll get you for tax evasion, bitch. I'll see to it. You're not going to have a dime left, bitch. So these are all of the things that he was saying, like she's writing the notes down of what he's saying to her. Um, And then on June 6th, three days later, he sent her a formal letter instructing her to stop using the Rockingham address. And she had showed this to a friend on June 7th. And on that same day, on June 7th, Nicole called a Santa Monica women's shelter for victims of domestic abuse and said she was being stalked by her ex-husband. So it's well documented what was going on here. Oh, t- oh, totally. But for context, I just need to point this out because I, I ran into this when I was doing you know, the research too, just to get well versed again for this conversation. So I have the book, If I Did It, which is a pseudo confession by OJ. Um, supposedly, like if he had been the killer, this is what 
would have happened. And he tells his whole side of the story in this book, apparently. Which, which of course, you know what he thinks it is. Which of course you would do, right? If your if your wife was oh, yeah, brutally murder, and murdered and you were wrongfully accused, you would write a book saying how you would have murdered her if you actually were the murderer. What well, that is just the craziest thing I ever heard of in my life. I mean. I, I know it, it's exactly, shocking. and then let's let's have this whole scenario of what you how you think it went down, in in comparison to what you just read, what she wrote in her journal mm-hmm. about the whole tax thing on selling a property and all of this. I want to read this portion of this. The one thing that she wasn't able to control was this constant harping about our living arrangement. She kept pushing me to let her and the kids move back into Rockingham, and I kept telling her no. I suggested that she rent another place, or better yet, buy one, and she finally took my advice and found a nice condo on Bundy near Dorothy Street. And remember, you just explained to us what this condo was like. Mm-hmm. It, was, it was decent, but it wasn't like Rockingham. Right. There was one major problem, though. She couldn't afford to buy it unless she sold her condo in San Francisco. And because the timing was wrong, she was worried about the tax bite. When she looked into it, she discovered that she could avoid the, that problem by claiming that the place on Bundy was a rental property and to indicate in her tax return that she and the kids were actually living with me. I didn't want any part of that scheme, and I told her so. The last thing I need is a problem with the IRS, I said. And then, of course, supposedly she said, but I don't understand. I'm going to be moving back in with you anyway. I can't do it, I said. So that was his whole conversation in the book. Yeah. About like what a great guy he was. He was just like, you know what, can't do it because, you know, I'm not going to get involved in the IRS. Meanwhile, he's like, I'm going to get you on tax evasion, you bitch. Yeah. You know, and it was like, so these are the two OJs. These right. are, this is the one that he wants to portray to people. The public, and the, public and the image other. and the private person, the real person. Correct. But one other thing that I thought about in here. So when she lived in Gretna Green and she was renting the property, there was an basically an in-law suite in the back of that property that Cato was renting. Apparently, he was supposed to be paying her $500 a month in rent. Whether he really was or not, I don't know. But um, that's what he was supposed to be doing. When she moved into the condo, the issue with it was that Cato would have to live in like a maid's quarters. That's what he called it. I'm assuming it was just some bedroom, you know, yeah. somewhere in the condo. And because of that, OJ took it upon himself to give Cato a place to live rent free on his property because he was jealous and didn't want him in, in there. Well, if you think about it, even if she had used the, the Rockingham address and they were, you know, at that point reconciling or trying to reconcile. Right. Um, And she was using that property. Truly she kind of was renting the place or she was planning on renting part of the condo to Cato. Right. But OJ took that away from her by giving him a place to live for free. Oh, yeah, right. I didn't think about so, that. Yeah. So if you think about it tax-wise, did he set her up mm-hmm. to be able to control her in that way? I think and so. And be like, yeah. You know, I mean, it, it's just a typical, even if it wasn't, but it sure all fell into place. Really, you know. It, it always works out for OJ. Uh-huh. You know, Mm -hmm. he's always going to find a way to to make it work out for him and to make things harder for her. Yeah. Yeah. So that was one thing that I loved when I was reading that, that one thing that, you know, kind of stuck out to me that whole time and the timing of it. So three days before the murders happened on June 9th, Nicole's friend and real estate agent, Jean McKenna, put the Bundy condo up for a lease at $4,800 a Mm -hmm. month. And then they went looking for a place for Nicole to live. And they actually found a place that she could afford in Malibu. So that was the plan. She's planning to move to Malibu. This was on June 9th. And how far is Malibu from Rockingham? It is, I did drive there because I was, it's probably about 20 minutes if there's no, if there's no traffic, but there's always traffic. So it's, exactly. it's, it's far. I remember because I was, but it's not four minutes around the corner. It's not around the corner. He can't keep an eye on her. He can't be, you know, I mean, the way he was. You can't just show up. Malibu is much more secluded as far as not being able to just show up on a busy street and look in through somebody's window. Right. Yeah. (laughs) 
Yeah, no, it, 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 yeah, it's it is a distance. So she was moving away from him, moving out of his control. Yeah, so by then he was already dating Paula Barbieri, who was the oh, model. Yeah, according to him, you know, as soon as him and Nicole broke up, him and Barbieri were back together. Which, you know, given his history, that probably it all overlapped. I wouldn't doubt, but. Mm-hmm. But one thing about her moving uh, to Malibu as well, one of the other things, apparently the kids liked where they lived on Bundy, but she didn't have a pool. So she wanted to have a pool at the new place, which the new place was going to have a pool. And if you go in through this book um, that he wrote, one of the things that he was always saying that she would just show up at the house with the kids, order around his staff. So, you know, while the kids were swimming in the pool. So if you think about it, that's another thing that he held over her head. Mm. But if she were moving on and getting her own place somewhere else that had a pool, she wasn't going to need to, you know, go over there quite as much anymore, would she? Right. Yeah. It's all these. It's so all again, this, the control. Yeah. All these little things that were like slipping out of his grasp, the way that he could, you know, control her. And also, uh, well, and the one thing, you know, she said she put that, that house up for lease. Well, the other reason, yeah, the reason that she put it up was for lease was it was a chess move from him sending her that letter saying, hey, you're going to get it for tax evasion. She's like, you know what? F you. I'm just going to go ahead and run it out because I said I was going to. So I'm going to run it and I'm going to get myself another place. Right. So that if you think about it, you know, you're right. There is another control where he was completely losing it. It was like, I mean, that had to tick him off. Yeah. It's totally. Like, and it's, it's like he overplayed his hand. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like he, he put that pressure on her. So she's like, okay, fine. I'm selling it and I'm moving away. And now it's like, oh shit. You know, now I have less yeah. control than I, than I had before. And I guarantee you, he, he knew either someone in their circle said she was over there, you know, searching for a property or she told him right. like, you know, F you, right. I'm going to get another place. So, and, and here's the other thing too, that I think people forget. And it's so funny because I knew a little bit about this from books and things I had read after the trial um, ended and all of that, the, when the books came out about his relationship with Paula Barbieri and how he had been, you know, seeing her quite frequently and, you know, for a while. And yet at the same time, he was still obsessing over Nicole. Some of you guys probably know there's a the podcast you're wrong about. And they did like this, I don't know, 12 part over like two years um, about the O.J. Simpson case. And the big portion of it at the beginning was Paula Barbieri's book. She wrote a book, which I didn't read, um, but I got a lot of it from the, that podcast. And they go into, you know, her relationship with O.J. And one of the things that she says repeatedly is she really loved O.J. She, she thought he was a great guy. She, you know, she was totally committed to him and all of that. But she said, he was obsessing over his ex-wife and I knew it. She said it was like there was three people in our relationship always because he would be angry about, you know, something she did and then I'd have to hear it or I wouldn't hear from him because he was too busy getting into something with, with Nicole or, you know, whatever. It was just on and on. So she was kind of like, hey, I'm all in, but you're going to have to choose. You're going to have to choose what you're going to do here. And as this was going on, like this last week before Nicole's death, she pretty much realized, you know, because it was even more because all this was happening. And she's like, you know, whatever. So on June 11th, her and OJ actually went out of some black tie event. Meanwhile, he's talking about this stuff because what we're going to know is the next day his daughter has this dance recital and the whole family is invited to go. I feel like he's starting to get the impression that he's being pushed out of the family not just by Nicole, but by everybody. It's like, we're all done with this. This is too much. So she needs to move on. You need to move on. You're doing your thing. She, you know, let her do her thing. And it's just be, you know, amicable, but keep our distance is what they're doing. So he's going on about this to Paula about like, he's angry about it. He's not really a part of it. Like he's kind of invited, but he was kind of not invited, you know? So yeah. at that point, it was right around that time. She goes to Las Vegas and she gets introduced to Michael Bolton. And she ends up like really liking him and he ends up really liking her. But she's like, hey, you know, this guy was, it was a breath of fresh air to have somebody just paying attention to me, you know? So the next day when OJ's already ticked off 
about the fact that they go to the dance recital and they don't invite him to sit with them. He's sitting separately from the family at the dance recital. And then they're all going to go to the restaurant to have dinner and he's not invited. So, and, and this is where the timeline gets in that, that you start to see like, oh, this is maybe what happened. He, you know, this is maybe what led up to him having this explosive anger. If, you know, we believe that this is what happened, which, you know, all the evidence points to the fact that this is what happened. So this is June 12th now. At 6 o'clock, Nicole Brown, Simpson, and OJ leave separately from their daughter's dance recital, where Simpson sat apart from his ex-wife and her family. This is an AP outline of the timeline in, in 1995, early 1995. At 6.30, Nicole dines with family and friends at Mezzaluna Restaurant. Waiter Ron Goldman was on duty. And that's where her mother, Juditha, leaves behind her eyeglasses. And later on, Goldman will offer to drop this off at Nicole's condominium. So around 8, Nicole and the kids leave the restaurant and they stop for ice cream on the way home. They stop at a Ben & Jerry's. At 9.15 is when Nicole's sister calls Ms. Luna to say that her mother had left her glasses at the restaurant. And Ron Goldman says he can drop it off on his way out. There was also speculation, oh, he was going over there to hook up with Nicole or whatever. But he actually had talked to a friend like before he left work. And he was on his way to his friend's house to go hang out with his friend. He was like, yeah, I got to go do this, this errand and I'll be there, you know, within half an hour or whatever. So it wasn't any plan that he was over there to go on a date with Nicole or anything like that. At least according to this friend, this witness who, and other people at the restaurant, I guess, heard the same thing. So between 9 and 9.30, Cato, who was staying at OJ's house in the guest house, and OJ go to McDonald's for dinner. And they're back by 9.45. And right around 9.50 is when Ron Goldman leaves the restaurant with the envelope cl containing uh, the eyeglasses. So this is from cell phone records. At 10.02 p.m., OJ attempts to call Paula. Okay, so he has left Cato at home at 9.45. He's in the Bronco, and he tries to call Paula a couple of times. She, I think they had had a conversation earlier in the day where she basically said, hey, you know, you're obviously you're still not over, you're ex what, whatever, and we've talked about this, and I don't think she told him about Michael Bolton, but, but you know, she wasn't going to be available. And he tries calling her at 10.02 p.m., can't get her, and by 10.15, the neighbor of Nicole Brown's Here's the dog barking. That's like where the timeline begins about when maybe the the murders happened, right? Because we yeah. know that Ron Goldman left at just 10 minutes to 10, and then we hear the dog barking between 10, 10, and 10, 15. A limo was coming to OJ's house, you guys know this timeline, to pick him up to take him to the airport. He had a business trip to Chicago planned. The limo driver arrives at 10, 25 p.m. His name's Alan Park. He's going to, you know testify at this too. 1025 he arrives and rings the bell I guess it's at the gate or something some bell or or intercom or buzzer or something and no no answer no answer no answer. Around 1040 10 15 minutes later is when Cato Kalen hears the three thumps outside of the wall of his guest house that's on the outer edges of the property near the back fence or side fence. The limo driver keeps buzzing between 10.40 and 10.50 p.m. There's no response until 10.50. 10.55, the limo driver calls his boss and says Simpson, Simpson isn't home. He is told to wait until 11.15 p.m. since Simpson is always late. Shortly before 11 p.m., the limo driver sees a tall, um, what he describes as a black person who he thinks is a male, looks to be about six foot tall, walking across the driveway towards the house. Uh, right after that, a couple minutes after that, Kalen goes to the front of the house to check on the noise that he heard. He sees the limousine driver at the gate. Several seconds later, Park then again buzzes the intercom and Simpson answers. He says he has overslept and just gotten out of the shower. 11 to 11.15 is Simpson's you know, hurriedly putting his stuff together to get into the, the limousine, get to the limousine. At 11.15, uh, the limousine leaves for the, uh, the airport. At 11.45, Simpson leaves on a flight to Chicago. So 
that's that's the chronology and that's going to be a big thing you know the defense is going to try and say he didn't have enough time and all of these things the, the limo driver's been waiting from 10 25 to 11 for simpson mm-hmm. to come out of the house and Cato heard the thumps right around 10 40 so that gives him 20 minutes in the house so then last night I went down a a little rabbit hole because I'm like, okay, I need to know (laughs) about this timeline because it's a big deal made out of it. Because here's the thing. Here's what the defense is going to claim. And, you know, um, we can talk about what happens, the whole thing with the Bronco chase and stuff and the timeline of that. But let's just quickly go through. He goes to Chicago at around midnight, 12, 10 a.m. on June 13th, which is, you know, that early that next morning. The dog, which is Nicole's dog named Cato as well, which is not confusing at all. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, is seen wandering by the neighbors. This is when the dog actually leads neighbors to the condo and the, and the victims are found right after midnight in front of Nicole's condo. Talk about when they f- go to his house later. But um, so at 6.30 a.m., OJ is called in Chicago and advised of the, by, about the murders by telephone and he flies back to Los Angeles. Um, we'll talk about why they decided to do this, but the t- at 10.45 a.m., the police obtain a search warrant for Simpson's property. At noon, Simpson arrives home. He goes into the police station, is questioned for about three hours, and then let go. June 16th is the funeral of Nicole. OG's there with his kids and Nicole's family. On June 17th is when he's charged with two counts of murder with special circumstances, and prosecutors say they may seek the death penalty. Simpson is supposed to turn himself in to police, and he says he will, or his, his attorney says he will, but he does not. He is then declared a fugitive, and this is the day of the infamous white Bronco chase. So I didn't know this was 60 miles he drove on the, on the freeways in Los Angeles that day. No wonder it was all, over, all around the TV forever. 60 miles. I know. Oh, my God. That's like an hour at least. You know, not counting any kind of traffic. Yeah, Al Cowlings is driving. It, it becomes this whole ordeal with people on the side of the roads because they know that OJ's coming and they've got signs out there that say, run, OJ, run, which is a uh, tie back to his Hertz ad spots where he's running through airports trying to, you know, get his Hertz rental car. It's this, it's this whole thing. He finally goes back to his home and where he's arrested shortly before 9 p.m. and jailed without bail. Six-day preliminary hearing start on June 30th, ends on July 8th. The judge rules that there's ample evidence to put him on trial. On July 22nd, he pleads he pleads in the court on television with probably millions of people watching that he is, quote, absolutely 100% not guilty. So that happens. And then the, they go through a grand trial and all of this, just, you know, everything goes on and on. And then we have the, uh, the trial that follows that the next year. The trial's going to get into the evidence where basically he's just going to have this team of lawyers who's going to say the crime scene was contaminated, the evidence was planted, you know, all of these things to, you know, to make their case that OJ is not guilty. But <laughs> June 17th, the Bronco chase. This is from a website, famoustrials.com. So the police had accumulated enough evidence indicating Simpson's guilt in the murders that they sought and obtained a warrant for his arrest under an agreement worked out with Simpson's attorney, Robert Shapiro. He was to turn himself into police headquarters by 10 a.m. the morning of June 17th, the day following Nicole's funeral. When he didn't show up by the agreed upon time, police told Shapiro that they would be driving to his Brentwood home to pick him up. Sometime after one o'clock, four officers knocked on Simpson's front door. Soon they and Shapiro discovered that Simpson had disappeared. It turned out on perhaps the most famous ride in American history since Paul Revere warned Bostonians of the arrival of the British. I didn't write this on famous trials. <laughs> Simpson left behind a letter. Okay, this is the thing. The, the, the so-called suicide letter is like the longest mm-hmm. friggin' suicide letter you ever saw ever in history. It's what, like three pages? I was, oh, my God. I was reading it, and it. It literally sounded like one of those things that you would write in someone's yearbook. It's like, hey, John, thanks for all the good memories and Judy. And you know, it's what? like, I'm like, what the hell is this? It's like, remember all the good times we had? And Yeah, like he's reminiscing and, you know, like, yeah. Like, like, or he's making a speech at a, a high school reunion. It, it's crazy. It's the craziest mm-hmm. thing. It sounds nothing at all like a suicide letter. It starts with, to whom it may concern. And it ends like this. Don't feel sorry for me. I've had a great life, great friends. Please think of the real OJ 
and not this lost person. Like you were talking about the two OJs. Doesn't that kind of make you think that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for making my life special. I hope I helped yours. Peace and love, OJ. And then he puts a smiley face next to the OJ signature. In the O. In the O, yeah. Yeah, Like in the O. (laughs) Like, what the (laughs) hell? Like he's signing a yearbook. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. So this is all day long. Like, where the hell's OJ? And his lawyer keeps telling the cop, no, we'll find him. We'll get him here. Don't worry. It's just going on and on all day. Around 6.20 p.m., a motorist in Orange County saw Simpson riding in the white Bronco of his friend A.C. Cowlings and notified police. Soon, a dozen police cars, news helicopters, and some curious members of the public were following in pursuit of the Bronco. The slow motion chase, because it wasn't a high speed chase, guys, it was very slow. (laughs) People could look into the windows and see what OJ was doing. It was so slow. The slow motion chase would finally end with Simpson's arrest in his own driveway. After making the arrest, police discovered uh, almost $9,000 in cash on Simpson, a false beard and a mustache, a loaded gun, and a passport in Cowling's vehicle. Well, apparently, when he originally got him in the car and he was supposed to turn himself in, um, that day, he told Al he wanted to go before they came, before he had to go turn himself in, he wanted to go to the cemetery. Right. That was one of his first stops was the cemetery. And yeah. then he got all he goofy, wanted, he wanted apparently. To go to, yeah, he wanted to go to the cemetery where Nicole was buried. And then he also said he wanted to go to see his, talk to his mother, see his mother. I mean, he was like, he was on tour that day, apparently, doing all these things before he turned himself into the cops. But he was supposed to do that that morning. One thing, too, is that I know during that time, because that whole letter and all of that, um, he was on some drugs. They had uh, prescribed, like, some sedatives and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what else he was on. But he wasn't staying at his own house, I don't believe. I Mm -hmm. think he was over at, I can't remember whose house he was at. I don't think he was at his own place. I thought he was at Kardashian's house because Kardashian came out with the bag. Remember, that's the thing they're going to say later. What what happened to that bag? It was like a garment bag. It was like a Louis Vuitton garment garment bag that never was seen again. And people were saying, what, did that have like the bloody clothes and the night, you know, in it? Which is crazy. And because, I mean, I have, I actually will post it. I have a picture of of, uh, Kardashian coming out, walking across his driveway with this bag. You know, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that too. Mm -hmm. And you think you're like, well, there's no way in hell he brought it back from Chicago with him, right? I mean, he had time to get rid of it. He could have dumped that anywhere, you know. And of course, there's all the reports that someone saw him near a garbage receptacle on his way out of at LAX. Yeah, right. Oh yeah, there was there was there was witness statements about that too. You're right. That was before he ever got on the plane. So you know, you know, any clothes or a, a knife or whatever could have been dumped at the airport. I mean, come on, think about how many millions of people yeah. are going to go to that airport by the time they think to go look there. Exactly. This is about the the chase. What happens is Al Cowlings ends up calling the, the police to tell them to back off because OJ's in the car. He's distraught. He just wants to go see, you know, wherever Al Cowlings is telling them back off, back off because, you know, he's going to hurt himself basically. And this was like a super famous thing. It was played over and over. And it's the end yeah. part that's really, I guess, the part that made it like a little legendary 911 call, right? Cowlings calls 911, making sure they know OJ is armed and desperate. 911, what are you reporting? This is, this is AC. I have OJ in the car. Okay, where are you? Please, I'm coming up the five freeway. Okay. Right now, we all we are okay, but you got to tell the police to just back off. He's still alive, but he got a gun to his head. Is everything else okay? Everything right now is okay, officer. Everything is okay. All about, he wants to, me to get it to his mom. He wants me to get it to his house. Okay. So that's all I... That's all we ask. He got a gun to his head. Okay, and then what, what's your name? My name is AC. You know who I am, God damn it. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, you know, it's like, oh, my God. It's so dramatic, right? It's so dramatic. Like, he's going to shoot himself in the head, and I'm trying to drive him to his house. You guys back off because he's going to kill himself. He's going to kill himself, you know? And it's like, and then he gets there, and he's pretty calm because there's helicopters. I mean, 
there's like swarms of helicopters over LA at that time, right? <laughs> yeah. And they're over Rockingham. So when he finally gets to Rockingham, it's it's pretty funny because you go from that drama to this. It was, it was very anticlimactic at the end. <laughs> Like, everybody's waiting for this, yeah. like, oh my God, it's going to be a shootout, and it's going to be, they're going to tackle, they're going to have to tackle him, they're going to have to, you know, uh, there's going to be a standoff because he's going to kill, you know, all this stuff. None of that happened. And again, it was OJ calling the shot. It's typical. Exactly the correct. The cops are doing it, you know, they're just doing what he asked. Ex- exactly correct. Let's put this in perspective because it's not like we were in another dimension. Mm-hmm. This was around the same time as the Rodney King incident, right? Happened right before all of this, right? Mm-hmm. But look at the difference. You know what I mean? Right. Like you're saying, you know, it's not like he tackled him, got him on the ground, and then, no, none of that. Yeah. It was just like, okay. And yeah. this guy had a gun in the car. Yeah. And it was a suspected murder of two people. <laughs> And yet it's like, yeah, just, uh, yeah, it's, but it's OJ. So, and that's the thing. So then when we get to the trial, what's going to happen is they are going to try to make, okay, let me just go over the evidence really quickly because there's so much friggin' evidence of this murder and OJ's involvement. Like, this is the thing that I guess maybe if you didn't live during that time and you didn't have all this information, like all at this, you know, coming out every day, every day, every day, more and more evidence, 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 evidence. And you break that down, you might think, well, you know, maybe he was framed. Maybe what you just said, because it comes out of that whole idea about the LAPD, right? The Rodney King thing, it just happened. And so the Mm -hmm. the, the, the Los Angeles police were already, you know, suspect in the eyes of the public because of that. Like, oh, they just, you know, do stuff and they get away with it. And especially against black men and, and all of that and how that explosive. That well, was. let's let's put this into perspective a little bit more. The L.A. Police Department during that time. And now I'm not talking about that particular area, but L.A. in general. Mm-hmm. It was terrible. The, yeah. the entire police force. There was so much corruption. There was so much, you know, all of these stories were coming out during that time. If you didn't live during that time, you don't know the difference in what it was like versus, I don't, I don't know what it's like today, right. but it did get better after that. But that's going to play off two different ways in this trial. Number one, it's going to make people already suspect the cops are not on the up and up, number one. Yep. And number two, it's going to um, make people think, yeah, why, why, would, why wouldn't they, they frame somebody? Why wouldn't they, they do that? And the jury is going to say, well... You know, can we believe the testimony of any of these detectives, officers, even the experts that work with the police crime lab? So all that's going to play into the trial. But the thing is, is we have to see, number one, there was so much friggin' evidence. There was so much evidence. Okay, so let me, this is what I wrote last night, because I remembered this, and I had read the books by the different detectives. And these books, they used their reports that they wrote And this stuff is all documented because they have to. That's part of being a homicide detective. Part of people that come to a crime scene, everything has to be logged. You know, when people get there, they have to, you know, log the time they got there and all of this stuff. There's all these procedures, these all these protocols. And I was reading all about that last night, this the very beginning. And this, I believe, was Detective Van Adders. Um, He was one of the main detectives with all of the reports that were filed that night when they discovered the bodies. Okay, so the bodies were found in front of the Bundy residence, like I said earlier, by a neighbor around uh, midnight, around 12 a.m. The first two officers, again, all documented, first two officers arrived at the scene at 12.20 a.m. They called in paramedics and backup police units right away. The first officer that was on the scene, again, the only thing they're supposed to do if they come to a crime scene like that is see if anybody is hurt and needs assistance. And he said he shone the flashlight, and this is a little bit, graphic but he said i knew there was no helping the woman because she was nearly decapitated there was so much Mm -hmm. blood that there was no way and then that's when he saw ron goldman's body he was kind of slumped in a halfway seated position and when he shone the flashlight in his face his eyes were open he kind of reached out he actually touched his eyeball and there was no response yeah Yeah. because to see if there was any response like was there is there any sign of life in this guy he had a white shirt on. They said, you couldn't tell what color it was. That's how much blood there was. Oh, and he said, so at that point, I backed off. We called in the paramedics again because they have to make the determination. You know, we can't just say, yeah, they're dead. Um, but we knew that they were. And backup police units and called in a double homicide. 
so then two other officers and their sergeant arrived and cordoned off the crime scene at that point. So it was, you know, all cordoned off. Paramedics arrive and pronounce victims dead at 1245. They don't move the bodies. The bodies stay unmoved from where they were because they knew when they got there, there was nothing they could do for them. The Los Angeles Homicide Detective Supervisor Ron Phillips arrived at Bundy at 2.10 a.m. So now we've got two, two hours. And this is when Detective Mark Furman arrived as well. But when they got there, they were the 16th and 17th officers logged into the call sheet on the case. That means there were already 16 officers who had come to the scene. Nobody had got within six feet of the bodies because it's all procedure, the way they have to do it. It was all mm -hmm. logged. Furman's partner, Brad Roberts, arrived about 2.30 a.m., so about 20 minutes after him. They were the first investigators on the scene. They also did not approach the bodies. They made a visual inventory of the crime scene, again, from the records. Um, homicide detective Philip Van Adder, who, see, they had to decide who had jurisdiction because L.A.'s got all of these different um, bureaus, which is like the departments, different play areas. Yeah. They first, they had to figure out who was going to be in charge, which homicide department gets this case and who's going to take it over and what's going on, because it's rob robbery homicide. And so they have to figure out, like, is it robbery homicide? Is, you, you know, whatever. Nobody had gone into the house at all at that point. Well, let me take that back. Nobody had walked through the walkway. The front door was, was open. They could look inside. They could see that nobody was downstairs. Meanwhile, they had talked to, I think it maybe was one of the neighbors who said, that's Nicole Simpson. That's O.J. Simpson's wife. And so they tried to get a hold of him, but there was no answer. They then had uh, officers come through the back door because they said, you know, they, she has two little kids. So they came to the back door. An officer went upstairs and got the kids, woke up the kids and took them down the back stairs and out and to get them, you know, to the police station to get them out of the house. Nobody had approached the bodies, the crime scene yet, and Phil Van Etter arrives at four in the morning. So it's four hours later. After he surveys the scene, the first officer who was on the scene, you know, saw the bodies first, tells Van Etter about a bloody glove was found right next to Ron Goldman's body. So he saw a glove there when he was flashing the light. Hadn't touched it, um, but he saw it was there. It was a glove and it had blood on it. So he told him about that. He also said that they saw bloody footprints were clearly visible on the walkway that was moving away from the bodies and towards a back gate. He, you know, again, with the flashlight not getting, you know, close or touching anything, the blood was also visible on the large. There were some blood drops or a blood drop. I think there was some, a few, also visible on the gate. So he's like, okay, it looks like somebody attacked these people, went down this walkway because there's bloody footprints, went out the back. That, that, that's basically all he told him. It was all visual. No one after the initial officers, the patrol officers on the scene, approached the bodies or the evidence, and they're not allowed to because uh, the coroner's investigator has to come to the crime scene first and then say, yeah, they're dead. But no evidence could be touched or collected, approached, until the crime lab technicians also arrived. There was a photographer from the crime lab who arrived at three, around 3.30 in the morning, but he was only able to take shots from a distance. He couldn't get close. So there was like more panoramic shots at the front of the, of the condo and where the bodies were positioned. Detective Tom Lang, he'll be the one in the second in charge or the two together, I guess Van Adder and Tom Lang are the, are the main detectives that were going to investigate this, these murders. He arrives around 4.30 a.m. Uh, Van Adder told the commander of the LAPD West Bureau to notify Simpson about his wife's death before the media found out because they knew he was a you know media figure and they're like oh shoot this is if this goes out on the radio this yeah. is something they bring up at the trial that the first officer when he called in this he did not call it over his radio he went through the back door to Nicole Simpson's house and used her phone that was in the kitchen to call in because he didn't want the media to hear about it um, mm. because the neighbors had already said that's Nicole Simpson, that's OJ Simpson. And he could see pictures of OJ Simpson when he looked inside the house, like with Nicole and all of that. So like, Oh, well, you know, he contaminated it because he used the phone while well, he wasn't anywhere near that. And nothing was found in the house. There was no blood or anything found in the house. Everything was outside. The person came in for the outside, went out through the, the back. They didn't find any, blood evidence or anything like that in the house. The other reason they were trying to get a hold of, of OJ was because they wanted him to come pick up his kids from the police station. You know, here's these two kids that were woken up from their beds and they're in a police station. I mean, 
of course, you want somebody, family there with them. And they said, okay, well, let's call OJ. So they were trying to get a hold of him. And of course, now they're going to say all of this was, uh, evidence was planted. The blood evidence was, you know, I mean, this goes on and on in the trial. We, you know, we kind of know this from the way that the trial was um, uh, conducted by the defense. But let's just talk about the evidence just to get that out of the way. Oh, geez. Good Lord. The blood evidence, hair evidence. Oh, my God. Where did I write Where this? wasn't it? Where wasn't it? It was everywhere. <laughs> everywhere. And that's when And they... everywhere in OJ's vehicle, yeah. in his house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> everywhere. Well, first of all, some of the things are like, okay, they, they find out later on about, or they put together later on the the domestic violence calls against, you know, him and Nicole and that it was ongoing and they had just broken up again for good. I mean, so all of that kind of plays into, yeah, he's, he's a suspect. And of course this is from least to, you know, most conclusive, I guess. Hairs consistent with that of Simpson's found on a cap at the Bundy residence on the, on the walkway. A hair is consistent with that of, of Simpson found on Ron Goldman's shirt. Why would that be there? Uh, fiber evidence, cotton fibers consistent with the carpet in the Bronco found on a glove at Rockingham. Fibers consistent with the carpet from the Bronco found on the cap at the Bundy residence. Here's the blood evidence. The killer dropped blood near shoe prints at Bundy. So, and they knew this was on the left side. There was like blood drips on the left side. Guess what? When OJ does get there to be interviewed, he's got a cut on his left hand, on his left Mm -hmm. finger. The blood dropped at Bundy was of the same type as Simpson's, and it says about 0.5% of population would match this. Simpson had fresh cuts on left hand on the day after the murders. Blood was found in the Bronco. Blood was found in the foyer in the master bedroom of Simpson's home. Blood was found on Simpson's driveway. Blood was found on socks in OJ's home that matched Nicole. Glove evidence on the left glove found at Bundy and the right glove found at... That's the thing. They found the left glove at Bundy and the right glove at Simpson's yeah. property. <laughs> With blood on it. Gee, let's just leave a trail. <laughs> by, by, yeah, by near where those stumps were heard on the side of Cato's guest house. They were Eris Light Gloves. That's the brand. Eris Light glo- Brown Gloves, size extra large. They had a receipt. Nicole Brown had bought a pair of Eris Light XL Gloves in 1990 at Bloomingdale's for OJ. Simpson wore Eris Light Gloves from 1990 to 1994. Uh, later, the shoe evidence, the shoe prints found at Bundy were from a size 12 Bruno Molly shoe. The bloody shoe impression on the Bronco carpet is consistent with a Bruno Molly shoe, and Simpson wore a size 12 shoe. About exactly why they went to OJ's residence when they did and what happened, and this is where now it's going to get twisted by the defense to make it seem like it was all a plot to get OJ. So the detectives are talking at the crime scene over the strategy, what they're going to do, you know, as far as investigating this crime, crime scene. And that's when the LAPD commander, uh, West Division, I believe, calls the homicide coordinator guy. And he's told that the commander's orders are they're supposed to contact O.J. Simpson in person to help him recover his children. Now, that's not something that would normally happen. But, of course, O.J.'s a celebrity, right? He's a, a, a public figure. So that's the only reason that would happen. Van Etter then asks, do we know where he lives? Phillips replies, well, Furman says he was once up there on a 415 radio call. That's a disturbance of the peace. Some sort of a domestic dispute. It's just a couple of miles away. So he knew it was close to where the crime scene was. Phillips' comment about a previous domestic dispute between O.J. Simpson and Nicole Brown passes without further comment. Lang says to Phillips and Furman, the four of us are going to go over to Simpson's place. We can meet the guy, make the notification, get his cooperation for background information down the road. The two of you will stay with Simpson and help him make the arrangements for picking up his kids at your division. Then Phil Van Adder and I will come back here and handle the bodies and the evidence. So Lieutenant Rogers, uh, which is Langen Van Adder's supervisor, approves of the plan, takes charge of securing the South Bundy crime scene until Lang and Van Adder return. Considering that Simpson lives just two miles away, I told you it was really close, Lang and Van Adder assume that they will be back in 20 minutes or less. Um, At this moment, neither Lang nor Van Donner view O.J. Simpson, who to most people is a beloved American sports icon, as an actual suspect in the murders. However, as the ex-husband of the dead woman, they must consider him a potential suspect, and this is consistent with routine police procedure. Okay, so this is they get to his house like around 5 a.m., so it's been like five hours, right? So they get to Rockingham, North Rockingham Avenue, towards Ashford Street, parked near the gate facing north and on the east side of the street is a white 1994 Ford Bronco. 
The street is narrow, like I said, and void of other parked cars. Lang notices the Broncos parked at an angle with its rear sticking out into the street. They see another car, a 300 ZX, which is, I think that's Cato's car, which is up ahead on the south side of the street. In only five minutes, they arrive at O.J. Simpson's home. Like I said, it was super close. They see a light on inside the house as they look through the barred gates. They also observe two cars parked in the, in the circular driveway, a Bentley and a Saab. Intercom tries, you know, presses the button. There's no answer. He tries again for several minutes. No answer. Uh, because of the cars in the driveway and the light in the house, they assume that Simpson is home and the intercom is broken. So while they're waiting for someone, Van Etter notices a sign for West Tech, a private security company near the gate. He suggests that Phillips call and get the telephone number to contact West Tech and request someone to come to Simpson's residence. You know, maybe they can get in to the gate or whatever. As they're waiting for West Tech to arrive, another West Tech car cruises up North Rockingham. This is the security area on routine patrol. So while they're talking to the security officer, the Furman walks over to the white Bronco and he also noticed that the car appeared to have been parked hastily with its right front tire over the apron of the curb and the rear tires angling toward the street. He shines a flashlight onto the back window of the Broncos cargo bay. He then calls out immediately to Van Adder. Van Adder then goes over to Furman, who shines his flashlight again into the back of the Bronco. Inside, they see a long-handled shovel and a plastic sheet. Also, they can read the words on one or two packages, Orenthal Productions. They know Orenthal is OJ's, you know, real first name. Mm -hmm. So like, okay, this is OJ's car. Then Van Adder shines the flashlight into the car and notices its doors are locked. But the guard then tells them that as far as he knows, Simpson is inside the house. A live-in maid should be in there as well, he says. He adds that if Simpson were away, he would have notified his home security service. Then Furman reports that the Bronco is registered to the Hertz Corporation. And of course, now they know, you know, it's connected to OJ. The Nissan is registered to Brian Ger Gerard Kalin, who is, has an address that's not in this neighborhood. We know that's Cato, who's staying in, uh, in the guest house. So Herman returns to the white Bronco, and he uses his flashlight, uh, conducts a brief investigation, and tells Lang, hey, I think I've found blood. So he shines a flashlight on a red speck smaller than a dime above the outside door, door handle on the driver's side. He also notices a piece of wood, which is about a foot long, on the grass outside the Bronco on the parkway. It looks freshly splintered and doesn't seem to fit anywhere in the area. It appears to have been broken off from a fence. So th then Lang says, you know, calls out to them and says, asks, is this blood? He says, yeah, sure does look like blood. And he says there might be a small amount of blood on Simpson's car door. Now they don't know what to think. They call Simpson's home now because they have the number. And it's 5.30 a.m. All four detectives hear the phone ringing inside his house. And they hear the answering machine switch on. Nobody answers. So Van Etter then turns to the others and says, let's add this up. We have lights on in the house and cars parked in the driveway. Simpson and his live-in maid are supposed to be home, but no one's answering either the intercom or the phone. And now we have blood near the door handle on the driver's side of Simpson's Bronco, which is parked kind of funny in the street, just a couple of miles from the scene of a double homicide. And one of the victims is Simpson's ex-wife. Do we have two connected crime scenes? Uh, Lang says something's wrong. There's lights on, cars everywhere, no one's answering. What if Simpson and his maid are in trouble in there? They agree that a potential emergency might exist and that they must enter the estate. If such circumstances will are perceived, police officers are permitted to enter a person's property without a search warrant, says. Now, they don't know whether Simpson is an actual or a potential suspect, but it's a moot point. The concern is for the safety of Simpson and his maid overrides everything else. But there's a five-foot-high vine covered wall. So Furman, being the younger guy, says, well, okay, I can go over if you want me to. They said, yeah, go ahead. So about 5.45, he jumps the wall, those other side onto the gate, and then opens the gate, allowing the other three detectives to enter. Van Etter has his flashlight on, scanning the area and looking for anything out of the ordinary. And this is when Cato comes out. A disheveled man answers. He appears to be in the 30s with long, blonde, silver boy hair and green bloodshot eyes. <laughs> He's wearing a t-shirt and pajama bottoms and saying, what's going on? And he tells them who he is. You know, they ask him who he is and all this. So they inspect him because they're like, Do, does he have blood on him? Is there, you know, something going on here? They don't see anything. So then Arnell, his daughter is there. Um, so she's woken up. Because Cato says she lives next door. And I don't know if he means the main house or if there's another house. Um, oh, it's an, no, it's another. There's it's more another than one house. bungalow. Okay. She's, yeah. Okay. So she's not in the main house. So yeah, she wouldn't have heard the bell or anything like that. Um, so now they want to know where the... Maid lives, they go into the main main house, and they don't see her in there. Everything seems to be fine, no struggle or anything like that. Kato tells them about hearing the thumps outside, so that's when they go walk outside. 
So this is when they start seeing blood in the house and, and everything and all of this gets collected really quickly because, you know, we get to the DNA evidence and stuff with all of this blood. These are things that should not, should not be. So at the Bundy crime scene, there's a blood drop by Nicole, blood not excluded from certain people. That's the way they put it, the DNA evidence. Blood drop by Nicole Simpson does not, not exclude O.J. Simpson, which means, you know, it could be O.J. Simpson's uh, and not Nicole's and not anybody else's. So basically it's just saying it's not, Hers, it's not Ron's, it's OJ's. Uh, There's a blood drop. There's like one, two, three, four, four, five blood drops by Nicole's walkway that are OJ's blood. Three on the back gate that are OJ's blood. The Rockingham glove, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten in the glove that are Nicole's and Ron's, Nicole's and Ron's, Nicole's and Ron's, Ron's, Nicole's and Ron's, OJ's and Ron's. OJ didn't know Ron, why their blood be together. OJ's, Nicole's, and Ron. I mean, it's just all of the three of them all mixed together on this on this glove. Um, Rockingham socks found in his bedroom. There was blood on the ankle of the socks found in OJ's bedroom. Nicole's, Nicole's, Nicole's. And some of it was OJ's. A steering wheel in the Bronco. OJ's and Nicole's blood. Driver's side carpet. Nicole's blood. And a bunch of OJ's blood in the, in the Bronco. I mean, all over the place. There was a... There was a footprint mm-hmm. in the Bronco in mm-hmm. blood. Right. Just like there was a footprint on the walkway of the same size. Okay. So they're yeah. saying, so, okay. So what the defense is going to say is that, you know, spoiler alert, because everybody knows this, you know, he, he actually is found not guilty after this year long trial um, that cost him millions of dollars for this team of defense lawyer, Johnny Cochran, uh, um, Robert Shapiro. And this is the thing is they're going to say that, it was contaminated, and the blood was planted. Blood was planted mm-hmm. by Mark Furman, who later they're going to say is a racist. So he was out to get OJ because, you know, he's a black guy and he doesn't like him or whatever. Meanwhile, Furman was the officer who had come out when he was beating the crap out of Nicole and also had uh, destroyed the windshield of a, of a Mercedes Benz and yet and didn't, arrest him. didn't arrest him. So he hates him so much. That would be a clear-cut way to arrest him and, and lock him up or whatever, or at least ruin his reputation, nothing else, and didn't do it. Didn't take yeah. that opportunity to do it at all. The timelines, there was definitely enough time. Like I told you, it's literally four minutes away, you know, and yeah. he had 25 minutes in between, you know, they hear the dog barking and, no, 45 minutes. And OJ, you know, finally opens the door or comes out at Rockingham. They would have had to have 17, 18, 19, 20 officers all there at the time when supposedly Furman is getting this blood and, and putting it everywhere. And nobody... Well, and also, where did he get the blood? Exactly. At that early he would have, So they took, they took his blood the next day. Mm-hmm. So they would have had to have gone back to the crime scene. Right. And planted blood that they had already reported that they found. Right. That's in, in the record from the moment that the officer first arrived, saying that he yeah. saw the blood there. So he's going to tell... And on the Bronco. So the first officer who arrived, who didn't know anything about who these people were, already had to have been calling Furman and saying, hey, you need to get over here and, and plant some blood so that I can put it in my record. I have to time warp back two hours to put that in my notes, yeah. <laughs> in that in the record. So you better hurry up. You know, uh, get in the get in the DeLorean and uh, set the set the with flux <laughs> capacitor to get there. I mean, it's ridiculous. It makes absolutely no sense. All of this stuff that they found at Rockingham at Bundy and you know Rockingham. There was this joke that I heard back when all this was coming out. You know, during the trial and stuff. Crime lab technicians coming out of Rockingham with garbage bags full of stuff that they have to test. Because there's so much stuff that they're finding in the house and on the property. Yeah. They're coming out with hefty bags full of stuff that they're going to have to test, right? It's not like, oh, here's a sock. I put that in a little, you know, paper lunch bag. There's like tons of stuff. And because there's so much blood everywhere, everywhere. The, the, the joke that I heard said, um, yeah, you, you see those cops coming out with these huge bags full of evidence. Hitler left less evidence of the Holocaust. <laughs> okay. <laughs> which is really bad and so inappropriate but i was like oh my god yeah this there was so much there was so much i mean and the reason i think that it was so easy to not 
believe that it was him for like the jurors and whoever was because there's no way if I were on that jury, I'd be like, there's no way someone with even half of, you know, brain capacity would be like, okay, I'm going to go violently murder two people. And then, oh, wait, I left my glove. Oh, wait, I dropped my other glove. Oh, man, I forgot my hat. Oh, gee, I you know, left my very easy to identify shoe prints. You know, it's like, they would have had to the know. Hell? They would have had to know his shoe size, his glove size, mm -hmm. what kind of gloves he'd been wearing for the last four years. It's ridiculous. Now, why? You know, like you said, all of those reasons, and also because the defense used everything they could to um, confuse the jurors. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I listened to the, the, the trial every single day it got so confusing and you gotta remember dna at the time was it was a new science no. to most of the public they didn't understand it there was hours and hours and days worth of marsha clark trying to explain to the jury what dna was and how you can tell that this you know they what the they percentage spent of people too much time on that all the technicalities much, of that way too much time on it and so there was a lot of stuff so the forensic evidence, like I said, was the blood evidence, the gloves and the cap that were left behind with the blood evidence, the DNA that was found with the blood evidence, you know, a part of the, the hair and fiber evidence, which is, you know, I mean, you could make a case that, yeah, that's not really conclusive a lot of times. Um, the shoe prints, the timeline, and his so-called alibi. There was also other things like the confession. Supposedly there was a confession. Rosie Greer, who was an ex-football uh, player, was a friend of OJ's, and he had actually become a ordained minister after he retired from football. And he had gone to the jail when OJ was arrested and was, was in jail awaiting trial, and a guard or two, one or two at least, said that they heard OJ getting very angry and irate and upset. The way they put it was, confessing to Rosie Greer about that he was sorry, being upset that the fact that he was in this position now because of what, what had happened and that he was sorry. Now, I don't know, because they weren't allowed to bring that in because it was hearsay. And of course, they couldn't compel Rosie Greer to testify because he was a minister. And if it was said yeah. within minister, what do you call it, parishioner or whatever um, yeah. context, then... And, and they did, they went to him and he said, no, <laughs> I'm not saying anything. It's between him and I, and I'm, I can't be compelled to testify because he's a minister. Yeah. And the, the crazy thing about that was that the guard, because what he heard was kind of, um, it wasn't like him saying, I killed her. You know, he was saying, I'm sorry. He, you know, he was angry and he was saying, I'm sorry. Rosie Greer said something like, you need to talk to someone. You need to tell them. That's what he overheard. Well, he didn't mention it. Mm -hmm. He didn't mention, he didn't report it. So the next day, when he came into work, his supervisor called him in and said, hey, OJ's over here basically making a big stink saying that people are trying to frame him, that it's been reported that he made some sort of confession. That isn't what they overheard. Mm -hmm. And he was like, what are you talking about? I didn't even say anything to anyone, mm -hmm. like what he'd heard. So he was already trying to clean up his mess of what he had said out loud mm -hmm. in anger before he had ever even mentioned it to anybody. Wow. <laughs> not incriminating yeah. or anything. Not a guilty no, conscience no, or not anything. At all. So the If I Did It book was the book after he got acquitted. You know, OJ is like, he was going to go look for the real killers. But then he decided instead to write a book to say, here's my somewhat cleaned up version of me and Nicole's relationship. And at the end of the book, I'm going to say, this is the way I would envision somebody killing my wife or me killing my wife if I had killed my wife, which is crazy. Somebody said about the book that says, there's no greater way to say I'm guilty than to publish a book detailing how you would hypothetically do it all in the name of profit. This is one of the excerpts from the book that I pulled out because I'm like, oh my God. I mean, I read the book a long time ago, but I had forgotten how bad it was. Again, this is written by OJ. Okay. Mm -hmm. If I had actually done with it, a ghostwriter, yeah, with a ghostwriter, yeah, but he's dictating it and this guy's writing it. So, you know, it makes sense. Yep. Quote, if I had actually done it, I would have brought my good gloves that day. I would have thought it was a shame they shrunk when I left them out on the patio, but I would have brought them just the same. Now, remember the gloves, if 
you know, they don't fit. You must have quit thing. So now he's mm-hmm. telling you why they didn't fit because mm-hmm. they were left out on the patio and they had shrunk. What? And, and okay. So exactly. it, it continues. They were my lucky gloves and I would have needed them because I was going to stab my slut of a wife. Dot, dot, dot. Hypothetically. He wrote this about the mother of his children yeah. who was brutally slain by supposed, you know, who yep. knows who. What? If nothing else, you know, exactly. you don't believe he's a murderer. The guy's a complete horrible, 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 horrible excuse for a human being to say yeah. something like that in print where your kids can read someday. Right? Yeah. And the, the thing about, you know, that whole book, I don't know if you'd already touched on that, but um, I have the book here. I actually bought it and and read it multiple times. And the reason that I bought it, because I wouldn't have bought it if it had been him publishing it. it. Basically what happened was when the Brown Simpson families found out that this book was about to be published, they got an injunction because mm-hmm. they hadn't, we hadn't even touched on that yet, but they, they had a um, civil suit against OJ. And they won. Um, <clears throat> later on. What was it? 26 they won. million dollars. And, Right. Yeah, it. I thought it was more. It was more. It was actually thirty three point five total. Okay. So oh, okay. twenty six is punitive, and then yeah, there were two different kinds of. So anyway, he had already gotten an advance for this book, but being true, you know, asshole that he was, he had set up all of these shell corporations under his kids' names, basically, mm. and all of the money funneled back down to him. This is how he was getting. Um, money for various things for his signing engagements, that kind of stuff, anything that he was, you know, making money on. Um, not to mention that he had a pension that mm-hmm. was not NFL. could not be touched. Yeah, an NFL, NFL pension monthly. He gets like uh, what was it, hundred thousand a month? Oh, I don't remember. Something ridiculous. <clears throat> it's a ridiculous amount of money, believe me. So even though he wasn't able to make money on endorsements because, you know, that money was all supposed to go to to the families, he did get this advance on this book. Well, when they found out about it, they were able to get the rights to the book. And of course they had to go to court and spend more money just to do that. And um, the last that I'd heard about all of this, so they were the ones that published it. Hmm. So if you actually ever see the book, if you ever get it in little tiny letters, it says, if inside uh, I, I, so it's, yeah. If I did it, so it says I did it, and the if is really tiny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it just says I did it. If anybody has any doubts on anything, you need to read this book because yeah. this is the one. I mean, he wrote this. They just intercepted it. Yeah, it, you know, it was, and it was, in, um, it was insane. And this is what he writes. God, he he writes this at the end of the book. It's like he's telling a fictional story. You know, quote unquote, a fictional story of if I did it. This is, it it doesn't even make any sense. It's like you're writing a a, a fiction story about your wife being murdered by you. It makes no sense. So this is part of what he says. He says, quote, I moved past the front door of Nicole's condo to take a closer look. Now, when you're reading this, you're thinking, this is way too specific. And it it Mm -hmm. really does feel, if you read it, he kind of goes back and forth. And it's very creepy when you read it. I mean, I got chills when I read it because I thought there's parts, when I'm reading it in my head, it's like, you're seeing it through his eyes like he was actually there. And then there's other parts of it that he takes himself out of it. And it feels like he's making that part up. You can really tell the difference when you read it. So this part, he says, I moved past the front door of Nicole's condo to take a closer look. There was candles burning inside. We know that's to be true because this was part of the crime scene report. And I could hear faint music playing. It was obvious that Nicole was expecting company, which, why is that obvious? You know, it's like, People put candles on, people who have music playing, you know, and it says, I wonder who the F it was this time. I wondered if maybe Faye, that was her friend Faye, was coming over with one of her boy toys so they could get all wild and dirty while my kids were sleeping upstairs, he puts in italics. Again, going back to that thing that he got enraged about that we heard about on the 911 call. In his own mm-hmm. words, in his own, you know, really angry, ugly words to her, he's still obsessing about that, of thinking about that. In a book in print. Yeah. You know, so it's like. Not only, not only that, but what he's obsessed about is during a time when they weren't even together. And he was stalking her, l- looking in her window. And, and <laughs> 10 minutes before, he was trying to call his girlfriend mm-hmm. because he was desperate to, to see his girlfriend. This is why I believe he got so angry 
is because in his mind, she's ruining it for me because Paula is pissed off because I have to be so obsessed with Nicole because she can't, she can't like behave herself and do what she's supposed to do, which is to sit in her house like an old lady and not have a life after me, you know, which is totally what it was. On the way to McDonald's, that was one of the quotes I remember. On the way to McDonald's, he's obsessing about Nicole and talking shit about her because he saw her that day at the recital. And he tells Cato, he's like, "Ah, she was wearing this black mini dress. He's like, what what kind of mother wears wears a dress like that where, you know, you can show all your legs? And he goes, what, is she going to still be wearing uh, mini dresses when she's a grandmother? Like, what is that about? Like, he's all pissed off. It's like... It's wearing a regular yeah. sun, like a sundress. And then he, she writes this at the end. It says, uh, quote, just as I was beginning to get seriously steamed, the back gate squeaked open. Again, it's like he's there. A guy came walking through like he owned the effing place. He saw me and froze. He was young and good looking with a thick head of hair. And I tried to place him, but I'd never seen him before. I didn't even know his name, Ron Goldman. You know, this is supposed to be a fictional thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're <laughs> describing him. You're talking about how the gates squeaked open yeah. like how would you know these things yeah like <laughs> it's so crazy it's so so crazy because he says this he accuses goldman of planning to sleep with nicole and goldman denies it now she's at the front door saying leave goldman alone he was just returning glasses this is the part he writes in the book that i was like i didn't even think about this but this this is too weird yeah nicole's akita the dog uh kato then comes out of the house and it wags its tail to greet ron This convinces Simpson, he writes this in the book, convinces Simpson that Ron and Nicole have a sexual relationship. Simpson yells at Goldman, you've been here before. So in Mm -hmm. his mind, he's now justified in killing this guy, you know, because the dog wagged its tail. What dog doesn't wag its tail when somebody, you know. And some dogs wag their tail when they're on alert as well. Mm -hmm. It's not a friendly wave. It's not always a friendly wag. It could be like what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Yes. Plus, it knows two of the three people in the scenario. Right. Yeah. So it's going to be like, okay, what's going on? Are we hanging out? What's up? Yeah. You know, not to mention the fact that they did say also that the police, when they got to Rockingham and Furman dr- jumped the fence to get onto the property, that there's an Akita on um, OJ's property. Yeah. That comes up and is nice and lets him sniff his hand and sniffs his hand. Yeah. And doesn't attack or anything. Right. It's not barking. So it's, it's like, not... yeah. So that's an Akita that, you know, even somebody got onto OJ's property that jumped a fence, it didn't attack. Right. So, yeah. Not the same dog, but still. It's, it's so funny because, you know, I go through this whole thing and I'm thinking, you know, we really didn't really need to do all this because it's so, I mean, the evidence alone is so compelling and there was so much of it and it was so immediately apparent of how this crime took place. Follow the blood yeah. trail. We didn't weren't even they weren't even thinking of OJ at the time, you know, because they didn't know the whole history of Nicole and OJ. Um, they may have for sure looked at him as a suspect later on, but this was within a couple hours. And they go to the house, they see blood there, they see the glove that matches the other glove, and they're like, "Holy shit, something happened here!" And they go in there, and before they know it, it's like, "Oh, okay, now we're putting all this together, and he is the main suspect." I mean, this is how investigations work. You follow the evidence and it led directly to OJ and nobody but OJ. But it was able to be twisted because you have, if you have enough money and you have the lawyers and you have the the prosecution, like you said, went too much into the weeds in the trial where they should have, you know. There were a lot of, yeah, if, if, I mean, if you want to, you know, go through everything on your own and investigate, maybe you've never really deep dived into the OJ case, but All of the problems with the actual prosecutors, what was going on in their lives, what Judge Ito was allowing, what, yeah. you know, I mean, if you put it all together, the climate in the country at that time, yeah. if you put all of those things together and and you just see <laughs> how it all got put together, you're like, it's incomprehensible that with that much evidence, he would have been able to get away with everything. But once you put it all together and you can see a reasonable doubt you know, where it came from. Here's the last thing too. It's over a year's worth of testimony, thousands and thousands and thousands of exhibits, uh, tests, DNA tests, bloods, you know, fiber timelines, witnesses, witness statements, police records, on and on and on that the jury sat through. Four hours, deliberated four hours before returning a not guilty verdict. 
Do you really think they considered yep. all the evidence? No. I think they thought no. they did and because in their mind they were like, this is what the defense attorneys were great at is everything that the prosecution threw, they confused the issue. They talked around in circles, mm-hmm. around and around in circles until people were like, I don't know, either way. So I'll just say, yeah, I can't, I can't say that that's for sure or not. And honestly, there were, and I, this is what I've, I'd heard, um, and I don't know, I don't remember the source, but I do know that it, you know, it was put out there that apparently at least one of the jurors had said, I don't care what the evidence is. There's no way I'm ever going to uh, uh, vote to convict Yeah, because of what had happened with the Rodney King. They were considering this OJ Simpson trial, the retribution for what had happened and that those officers that had beat Rodney King had not been, had not, you know, had been found not guilty. Right. But the two defendants could not be more different. You have you have OJ, oh, yeah. who was a celebrity, who was wealthy, who was well connected, who had, you know, money for the best defense, who had been given every benefit of the doubt by cops for his entire life, um, especially with Nicole, where he just really didn't suffer any consequences for some, I mean, really horrible abusive behavior. Then you have, oh, well, yeah, Rodney King. I mean, this poor guy, I mean, he was a mess, and he got his ass beat for being high, basically. And yeah. so it one did not equate to the other I mean, at all. No, no. I mean, it was, I mean, it all, all the entire trial started off, you know, when they moved it from the area where the actual crime occurred to moving it to downtown yeah. proper. And part of the reason they did that was because they were like, well, it's got to be a jury of his peers. And they thought it would be better to do it there where it would be more of what people would perceive as a biased uh, jury Mm -hmm. based on the ethnic background of the uh, jurors that would be pulled from that area versus downtown L.A. And and a lot of the things that was um, funny, you know, if you you take a look, you know, don't want to get into all the race things, but. But during that time, I mean, the majority, OJ, yeah, he had friends that were black, but he had a lot of friends that, that were not, yeah. you know, they were all different races and, and he ran in the circles that were not necessarily of his background. They right. were, you know, people with money and people that were, you know, look at Robert Kardashian was one of his good friends. Right. Yeah. And if you, you, if know, you really, it, want, if you really want to get into into that whole thing, because I think it's really interesting to see like where he came from and who he really aligned himself with pretty much his whole career, his whole professional career and his career as a business person. Watch that ESPN, that documentary series 30 for 30 about the OJ, OJ Simpson. Mm-hmm. Man, that, that really gives you uh, they did a, a really great job. It came out a few years ago. And uh that one, if you really want to know, like who he was and who his friends were and what he was thought of, even by the LAPD, you know, he was like this hero. He was a hero to everybody. Yeah. They were not, you know, trying to be against him or, yeah, he's going to, you know, just frame him. There was no reason at all. There was no indication at all that they ever thought of him anything but a good guy, a valuable community member, a friend to the cops, you know, even though he was he was an yeah. abusive and, asshole. But they that didn't you know that didn't bother them that much. And even with all of this information that's come out, all of the the trial, all of this evidence, all of you know, the nine one one calls, all of that that stuff, do a little, you know, uh, investigation of your own. Go on TikTok, go on Instagram, go on anywhere Mm -hmm. and look up OJ Simpson and look at all the people that have uploaded videos, hanging out with OJ, taking pictures and selfies with OJ. Like he's just still the biggest celebrity in the world. The man is a convict. Yeah. (laughs) You know, I mean, maybe not for murder, but he did go to to prison. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. You know, it's like, but yet he still has this persona. He's still that person. And can you imagine when he was in his heyday and yeah. the amount of people that were like in awe of him, right? It, it still, it still happens today. It happens today. You know, and it's all like, this, you're right. You're right. Yeah. It makes crazy. no sense. It's crazy, but that's our cult of personality. We have in, you know, in the world and especially in America, it's like you celebrities 
can do no wrong. I mean, we're, we're getting, it's changing a little bit slowly, but there's still a lot of it, you know, uh, people love to talk yeah. about them and, you know, people want to talk about cancel culture and this and that, but celebrities really get away with a lot before anything happens, you know, if, yeah. and, you know, to be honest, it, well, it really does. <laughs> unfortunately with cancel court culture, it seems like you can do one little tiny thing and somebody jumps on it and then, you know, yeah. then they're the worst person in the entire world. And it's like, okay, that, did you see what this other guy did? You know? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. But it's crazy. I'll put links up to some of the stuff you guys want to go into the weeds because uh, there's there's a lot. That's like I said, we barely scratched the surface and, you know, we talked about yeah. a, b- a bunch of things. But anyway, that's our take on it. You guys can believe what you want. I do I will say this, that because true crime has, you know, exploded and there's so many things out there, you will see things where people will take it from this other vantage point and say, well, he could have been framed. It could have been somebody else who did it. It could have been a drug dealer. It could have been, you know, this and that. There's all these different theories that really hold no water that have all been debunked if you really look into them, or they're just theories that really have no weight behind them at all. It's just interesting to think about. And of course, it's because the only- people might want to see I want to watch that to see Ooh, yeah. what else could have happened, you know, but I have not found anything that the only other me theory. Otherwise. Yeah, the only other theory that I, I'm, you know, would kind of go with is that could there have possibly been somebody else there with him? And in my mind, there is, and there is only one person that I think that might be. I don't think that it it was ever looked into enough. And if y'all want to do your own research, you can figure out who that is pretty easily. I won't go into it, but, (laughs) um, you know, there's no evidence. Let's just put it this way. He retained a lawyer for someone pretty soon after the police talked to him. Mm somebody that was never even mentioned or looked into. So why? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. I mean, but that would be the only other thing that I could think of. And I mean, maybe was there a getaway driver maybe, you know, because when I was reading um, the reports with the detectives, they were like, you know, the only blood drops we saw, the only footprints we saw was only one person. We believe it was one perpetrator, you know, there, but could there have been, Somebody who drove him there. Somebody who, maybe, yeah. you know. There, there is, somebody I guess, standing off people, to the side. testimony yeah. where there's a woman who says that she saw OJ, you know, driving that night. But those eyewitness things, I don't know how much weight I give them because people can misremember things or just want to be part of the story. So I, And I also, don't they were in that same area where he drove all the time. Yeah. So, could have seen you him know, another I mean, it could have been a different day. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. I mean, they're interesting to think about, but unless they're corroborated somehow, I don't think you can put much much weight behind no. those. It's interesting to think about. But anyway, I just want to say thank you for coming and helping me with this discussion. Yeah, it's always fun. And people always like how we tend to kind of riff off each other. And <laughs> we, we talk about this stuff. We were talked about this stuff for years before we, you know, I even started a podcast. So it's pretty easy to to get into a discussion about this, this kind of stuff. But it is a big case. So we weren't going to do it justice with all of the details. But hopefully you guys had enough to at least pique your interest, like Yolanda said, to go take a look at some of these things. I will put links in the show notes of some of the really cool um, timeline things and the DNA testing and all the stuff that I found if you guys want to go down that rabbit hole. So Knock yourself oh, out. Oh, yeah. Rabbit holes for days. <laughs> and, and if I did it, you guys, if you have not read that, you should really check it out from the library or something because it is, it's, it's an amazing, I don't even know what to call it. I don't even know what to call it. Yeah. It, it's just. And, yeah. and the money goes, the money for any of the cells of that book go back to the family. Yep. Go so. back to, go back to the victim's family. So yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, you won't feel bad about, about reading it. Once again, I'd like to thank my special guest, my baby sister, Yolanda, for helping me break down this monster of a case. It's always fun to have her on the podcast, and I hope you enjoyed it. I'll be back next week with the last episode of 2021, and I'm really looking forward to another fascinating discussion with another special guest, podcaster, author, and filmmaker, Jesse Pomeroy, who will help me break down the Chris Watts case, and I can't wait. Make sure to follow or subscribe so you don't miss it. Once Upon a Crime is written, produced, and edited by me, Esther Ludlow. Final sound mix for this episode by Lorena Garcia. Thanks for listening and telling a friend. If you'd like bonus episodes of Once Upon a Crime, you can become a patron for as little as $2 per month. Go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime to find out more and join. Until next time, be good to one another. <laughs>